and let's all stand all over the house this evening. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Come on, he's worthy to be praised, amen. Man, we are so thankful that you've joined us once again. I tell you, God is just on the move right here at Encounter Church, and we are just so excited what the Lord has done this entire week. And I'm telling you, we got two more nights, and I believe the best is yet to come. How many will agree with me that the best is yet to come? I believe that you and I are here, not by coincidence, but I believe that you're here because God has called you at this moment for your right now miracle, amen? Something that Pastor Ted said at the very beginning, he said he believes that this week is going to be a week of breakthrough and turnarounds. How many have already received a breakthrough this week? Come on, give the Lord some praise, amen? Some turnarounds. You know, what the devil meant to harm, God's going to turn it around for our good. And I just encourage you at once again tonight, as we press in, as we get into the throne room of God, release heaven in this house, I just know that we're in store for something great tonight. Amen? On a Thursday night right here in Fredericksburg, Virginia, I believe that we are in store for something good. Something good is about to happen in this house tonight. Amen? Come on, I believe that. Amen? So, Father, we just give you praise and we give you glory. Father, we magnify and lift up your holy name. Father, I pray that you would touch every heart, touch every mind. Father, as we enter into your worship, God, as we enter into praise tonight, Father, we thank you, God, that, Lord, breakthrough and turnarounds are taking place. God, that we just give you praise and glory for everything. Father, we push back every distraction. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we release heaven into this house tonight. Father, we thank you right now, God, that the best is yet to come. Father, we thank you right now, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise in advance of what you're going to do tonight. I said, Father, we give you praise in advance of what you're going to do tonight. Tonight is our night for a breakthrough and a miracle in the mighty name of Jesus. So we give you praise and we give you the glory. In your name we pray. And the mighty church said, come on, give them a shout of praise this evening. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley, I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, I'll praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. I'll praise in the valley, I'll praise on the mountain, I'll praise when I'm sure, I'll praise when I'm drowning, I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded, cause praise is the water.
control My praise is a weapon It's more than a sound My praise is the shout That brings Jericho down As long as I'm breathing I've got a reason to pray Cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you I praise, I praise cause you're sovereign Praise cause you reign Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave I praise cause you're faithful Praise cause you're true Praise cause there's nobody greater than you Praise the Lord, hold my soul Over the water, spirit come move 
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad because I put my faith in Jesus. He's
Come on, lift your hands all over this house tonight. Let's magnify Jesus. Come on, take a minute and just glorify the name that's above every other name. Father, tonight we thank you for your power and your glory that's in this house. Once again, we came expecting something supernatural from heaven. Lord, I pray, pour out your spirit all over this place tonight. Don't let one of us leave this church without receiving a touch from heaven. Let us have a divine deposit. We're leaving on another level in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray, do such a supernatural thing that even those that know us would look and say, what in the world happened to them? What took place in them? It would be a clear recognition that your power is working mightily in us. We thank you for that. We expect 2024 to be a year of breakthroughs, a year under open heaven in Jesus' name. We thank you for it. If you believe that tonight, clap your hands and give Jesus all the praise. Oh, come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Well, haven't you appreciated this worship team every single night? Would you give them a hand? Tell them that you love them. Before you sit down, why don't you greet one or two people? Welcome them into the house of God tonight. We're so glad you're here. It's good to see you, those of you watching online. Thank you for being with us. Thanks for tuning in. Great to have you in the house of the Lord. Praise God. Well, somebody shout, tonight's my night to receive a touch from God. Say it one more time. Tonight's my night to receive a touch from God. Thank you, Josiah. Appreciate that. Praise the name of Jesus. Let me ask this question. How many tonight is your very first night at this week of meetings? Would you lift your hand and let us see? Would you welcome, make them feel welcome, every person? So glad you're here with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining us. So happy to see every single one of you. And uh, this has been an amazing and wonderful week already. We've had miracle testimonies. God's moving. And we're not even done. We got tonight. We got tomorrow night. I can't believe how quickly this week is going. But... Um, I'll tell you, I really love preaching to you. You're wonderful people to preach to. And uh, for those of you that don't know, I spent really the first part of my ministry, the first really 15 years of my ministry uh, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. That's where I was planted. I was an associate pastor and a youth pastor there for 15 years, actually 10 years or 9 years of doing that. And then I started traveling as an evangelist full time uh, from Virginia Beach and then all over the nation and other nations. And then the Lord in 2017 told my wife and I, out of, out of the clear blue, I was literally driving in a car at night from, um, <laughs> as opposed to what, like a rickshaw? I was driving in a car. I was driving in a car at night. I was driving a bicycle from state to state. I was in a car, and I was going from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, going to Rochester, New York. And uh, I was just praying. I said, you know what? On this trip, I'm not even going to listen to music. I'm not going to listen to podcasts or audiobooks or teaching or preaching. I'm just going to pray in the Holy Ghost for the whole drive, just the entire drive. And so I started praying. I mean, it wasn't even 10 minutes of praying in the Holy Ghost. I hear the Holy Spirit start talking to me. And the first thing I heard, he said, move your family to South Florida and told me what church even to attend and all that, which I know people hear that word from the Lord, like, must have been a hard word to obey, brother, but no. Actually, I had never liked Florida. I still really don't like most parts of Florida. I don't care for Florida. My wife is from there, and she, when she left and came to Virginia Beach, she said, I'm never going back to Florida. I'm not raising the family there. I'm not going back. And so it was probably right around midnight, and I called her, and I said, the Lord just gave me the wildest word. He said, move to South Florida. Now she was sleepy and ready to go to bed. Now she's up and wondering about it. She's praying about it, you know. And I didn't like Florida. She said she's never going back to Florida. And then the Lord gave us an instruction. And we didn't know why. But because when you're an evangelist, you can live anywhere and still travel to the revivals you have scheduled. And Virginia Beach is a great place because, you know, you're right there halfway up the East Coast on the eastern seaboard. I could drive north into New England or those states. I could drive south to the Carolinas or Georgia, those states, Florida. But I said, Lord, you're moving me to the tip of Florida all the way at the bottom. You know, back then we drove to all of our meetings. I said, Lord, man, it's going to take me a full day of driving just to get out of the state to go to some other state to preach. 
And little did I know the Lord was positioning us for increase and breakthrough. And uh, as soon as we got there and started obeying the voice of the Lord, things began to explode for our ministry. And uh, not only did God give us, man, I, I don't even know, do we have, I don't know if I showed it last year, do we have the picture of like the, the drawing of the studio and the actual studio? Do we still have that in the media kit? I don't know if we do. I can, t I can talk about it. You don't have to show it. But I, I was, we were living in a rental house. And um, I was online every day, you know, teaching and preaching on YouTube, Facebook when I wasn't in meetings. And my father came and held a revival in South Florida. And uh, he, he came back to our house that night after the service. And he said, you know, I, heard, I saw something in the Holy Ghost tonight that I didn't say over the microphone. And I said, what's that? He said, the Lord shows me you're about to get a, a building. I said, thank you, Jesus. And so I was using one of the little offices of my home as our studio and recording studio and broadcasting. And my wife brought him a piece of paper and a pencil. And she said, would you draw what you saw in the spirit on this piece of paper? And my dad started to sketch that building. And man, my dad did a great job. It looked, it looked I mean, it was very specific. He showed what the building would look like. He showed where the palm trees would be positioned at the building. So we put that on the refrigerator. That was like our point of faith. God was going to give us that space. So we didn't just do that. We took steps of faith. We got a realtor. So we want to start looking at spaces because we've got a space coming to us in Jesus' name. So we went around, and they took us some real nice spots. But they were not, they didn't look anything like that picture that we had from my father who had prophetically seen it in the spirit. I said, well, they're all nice, but none of them are really for us. She said, well, there's, you know, my, my wife said, isn't there one more? She said, yeah, there's one more back here. It's kind of in the back, out of the, out of the way. And, you know, it doesn't look like the owners updated the pricing or anything like that. You know, South Florida, and I know you're, you're in an expensive part of the nation here, you know, right, right outside of Washington, D.C., and you all know what's happened in Florida over the last four or five years. Things of just real estate has exploded. When I tell you exploded, people were buying homes in Florida that didn't live there, sight unseen, with no inspection. As soon as a house would go on the market, they'd snatch it up. I mean, less than 24 hours, and real estate went through the roof, expensive. And so he, she said, it doesn't look like, you know, that the pricing's been updated and everything. I said, well, let's go look at it. We drive onto that parking lot, and when we drive in and see this building, <laughs> it looks exactly like what my father drew on the paper, even to where the palm trees were at. And he had told me, he said, I didn't draw us, I couldn't see the second story in the spirit. When we get there, it's a one-story building. There was no second story. And it was, everything was exact. So we talked to the owner, and they said, uh, looks, and there's the picture my dad drew. There, that, that's the actual sketch that he made. And then we have the picture of what the building looked like, and that was the exact spot, exact spot we found. And we came in, and I said to the owner, like, what is the price you're going to give? Because it looks like you got old pricing up. The reason I say it looked like it was old pricing, it was less than half of every other place we looked at. He said, no, that's the pricing I'm going to give you. And we went into that spot. And as we stepped in there, uh, we didn't tell anybody that we had got this spot. We didn't send out a partner letter or let anybody know what had happened. We just took the time. This was in 2020, by the way. We took the time to move our gear in. We prayed over it. We had a big old LED wall put in. It's setting it up for broadcasting and all this different stuff. Well, no one knew we'd got it, you know, except my father. And uh, a partner of ours in Georgia felt in their spirit. They said, you know, we feel to sow this seed into Miracle Word. And all of a sudden, here comes this check in the mailbox. We open it up. That check paid the whole year of this building in one offering. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Then not knowing anything, just led by the Holy Ghost. And so God opened that up, and then we launched. And then we got more spaces in there and launched us on television and literally opened us up to 180 nations of the world every single week on TV. I'm telling you, it's amazing what happens. Now, I wanted to say that because I wanted to show you something. God will do things in and through us by the power of impartation. Everybody say impartation. And many people don't talk about it. Almost nobody knows what that is anymore. Some Pentecostal denominations act like they don't even believe it. But impartation is simply the transfer of something that you didn't previously have into you. It can be a transfer of wisdom. Wisdom can be imparted. It can be spiritual gifts. They can be imparted. Power and authority can be imparted. These things are found in the Bible. 
And when the Lord started speaking to me, we moved to Florida. On that subject of impartation, we were in the pool. Me and my, my two daughters, they're sitting right there, Maddie and Brooklyn. They're older now, obviously. But they've been so competitive their whole life. And here we are in the pool. And, you know, Maddie is super good. She's like, let's race. I want to race. And so they're getting there. And she's, you know, she's older at that time. Brooklyn would have been, how old do you think, when we first moved to Florida? 2017, she was four years old. So here she is, four, and already swimming. And Maddie, older than her, Maddie would have been, what, seven at that time. And she's like, let's race. Well, three years older, better swimmer. And she's just beating her sister every single time. And then finally, Brooklyn's all upset. Daddy, she's cheating. You know, whatever you can say at that point. You know, I'm just getting beat every time. I said, all right, Brooklyn. I said, let's do one more race. Maddie's already ready. She's up on the wall ready to kick off. I said, let's do one more race. And I winked at Brooklyn, and she knew what that meant. Daddy's going to help you. And I got behind her, and I said, all right, Maddie, you ready? Yeah. Three, two, one, go. And Maddie kicked off, and she's underneath the water swimming her heart out. I took little Brooklyn, and I threw her through the air with everything I had. I mean, I launched that girl. And she's flying through the air, you know, across the pool. And she lands, splash, and she's swimming so hard. Maddie comes up for a breath of air and sees her sister way out in front of her and is like looking confused. <laughs> what in the world happened? And then finally, Brooklyn gets to the other side and grabs the wall first and wins the race. At that point, Maddie realized what had happened. Dad had given her help. And the Lord spoke to me through that. And he said, do you see what just happened right there? Your daughter, Brooklyn, could have raced over and over and over again and never won one race. She didn't have it within her to win that race. But then you attached your strength and your power to her. And because you had put that impartation of force into her, it allowed her to win a race she couldn't win on her own. It allowed her to go further, faster. Everybody say further, faster. And the reason I say that, we put that in because nobody in the body of Christ was talking about it. Some were bad-mouthing it. But do you know impartation is the force God uses to take what you're called to do farther in your life. You shouldn't have to start at ground zero every generation. You know, my grandfather pastored 62 years, but I didn't have to start where he started. My father is ministering still today, and he's 69 in April, but I didn't have to start where he started. Thank God for those that have gone before us. But we should be able to receive from what they've done, what they've learned, what they've taught, and go further than they ever went. Can you say amen? amen. Say this with me. Their ceiling will be my floor. Say it again. Their ceiling will be my floor. And we put out this book called Further Faster, how God uses the force of impartation to accelerate your purpose. We have that in the back. Who'd like this one? If you don't have it, who would? I saw your finger go up so quick. That was, you're like quick draw McGraw. I've never seen anything like it. Praise God. And you know, the power of praise, I'll say this, because there's words, I got a word in my spirit for you tonight. God gave it to me last night. And I'll tell you, one thing I've watched through our ministry take place over and over again is that when we start praising God, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of Israel. Just as we were worshiping and praising tonight, could you feel that anointing flowing through this place? You know, it's not just positioning our heart to receive what God has. It's literally provoking his presence to move. That when we start praising him, there's no way that he will not begin to manifest his presence as we start praising him. I was preaching, uh, actually I was leading worship, my father's camp meeting, which is every April in West Virginia. I was up on the keyboard, and one night we were singing and praising God, and uh, as we were, there were two gentlemen that had come in the meeting that night. The first guy came in, he'd been in a car wreck that had injured his spine, and as a result, it crippled him up. He was on two crutches, and he couldn't hardly walk right from that car accident. And he came in, sat on the edge of this section right here, and the guy behind him sitting in the seat had just had a surgery that went bad. And as a result of that surgery, it left him blind in his right eye and a deaf in his right ear. That side of his face was affected from the surgery. And we're sitting there praising. And nobody's preaching yet. Nobody's laying hands on anybody. But we're singing a song. There's a woman from eastern Kentucky. And uh, she's a Holy Ghost woman. She wrote a song. I love singing it. It's called Funeral Plans. And the, it's a funny name for a praise song, but that's what she wrote. 
And the chorus says, when I die, let me die speaking in tongues. Let it ring in my ears all of these songs I've sung. Give me strength to praise you. Speak your name one more time. Then have your angels carry me over to the other side. And we were singing, everybody shouting. All of a sudden, that guy with the crutches, he's got the crutches up under his armpits and he's lifting his hands to praise. All of a sudden, you could see the power of God touch him. And when he did, he threw those crutches down, took off running around the church, healed by the power of the Holy Ghost. When he threw the crutches down, the man behind him started jumping like this. And you could hear him shouting over everybody singing, I can see, I can hear. God opened his ear and opened his eye in that moment. Now what happened? Because nobody laid hands on those guys. Nobody anointed them with oil or touched them with a prayer cloth. Nobody even spoke a word to him, be healed in Jesus' name. But just as we were praising God, as we praise God, the Bible said God comes and inhabits the praises of Israel. So what happens when God's presence shows up? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3.17 that the Lord is a spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. So chains have to break. Doors have to open. When God shows up, hallelujah, praise is so powerful. If you were here on uh, Monday night, we saw miracles take place, healings. I preached on blind Bartimaeus who shouted something different to Jesus than everybody else was saying. They were all saying, here comes Jesus of Nazareth. But Bartimaeus said, Jesus, son of David, that was a praise. When he said that, that was a praise. Why do you say Because he was saying, I believe you're the Messiah. I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you're, and what he was doing was provoking Jesus' power to receive his miracle. And Jesus, who was passing by everybody else, stopped when he heard Bartimaeus and turned around and said, bring him to me. And in that moment, the power of Bartimaeus' praise opened up a blank check from heaven. And Jesus said, what would you have me do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Hallelujah. It only took one praise from Bartimaeus to open up the power of God. And I'm telling you tonight that there is power in our praise. Do you know that the thing, uh, this blew my mind. I saw this. Let me have the one right under that. The, The one under that. This is interesting to me. The thing that God gave Israel to bring them total victory all the time, which was praise. If you've read 2 Chronicles 20. He said, there's three armies coming against you, but tomorrow, just go out against them and begin to praise. And I'll fight your battles for you. Do you know when they went into captivity, Israel, the Bible says in Psalms, they took their harps and hung them on the willow trees. The thing, the praise that brought them victory so many times before, they put it on the back shelf. It's no surprise to me that they went into captivity because they had forgotten the God that they'd served for so long. And God gave it to me because it's time for us to get our praise back like we never have. (laughs) Hallelujah. It's like the apostle wrote the song in the 1970s, get your back up off the wall. And so (laughs) there's people that come, sit in church, and just take it all in. No, we're called to engage. We're called to get into the presence of God and to sing and to shout and to dance and to clap our hands. Amen. And when we do, things have to turn around. And I got into this, and I started studying that, and the Lord showed me praise can actually open the door to every blessing God set aside for you. I called the book Unhang Your Harp, because if they hung those harps on the willow trees, I'm taking mine off the tree, and I'm going to praise like I've never praised. Can you say amen? Did you know praise doesn't just open up for your healing, but for your joy? for your peace, for your blessing, for your family. Addictions have to break as you begin to praise God. And this book will show you what the Bible teaches about the power of praise. Can you say amen? Who'd like that one? If you, Man, you were quick on that. I saw you. That You were waiting for me to say who would like this one. That way I tell you, God bless you. Finally, let me just give you this. First thing I ever, ever wrote in my entire life. This book is called Praise, Laugh, Repeat. Living in the power of overwhelming joy. I was in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, preaching. It was a youth conference, youth retreat. It was all these churches together in one youth youth meeting. And man, 
I had laid hands on everybody. I mean, like literally, Pentecostal style, if it's moving in the building, I'm going to lay hands on it. Church mice are getting hands laid on them. Miracles are happening for them, taking cheese off the trap, but it won't go off. It's a breakthrough. Hallelujah. I mean, I was praying for everything that moved in the building, and I thought I was done. So I was walking up the stairs to end the service, and I heard the Holy Ghost say, you're not done yet. I'm thinking, Lord, I prayed for everybody in this place. He said, turn around and go down. And he showed me why it was like right on the end. The dude was sitting where pastor's sitting. He said, go pray and cast the spirit of suicide and depression off that young man. Well, I wasn't looking at the young man. My back was to the crowd. So when I was going to turn around, I expected to look and see some, you know, when you hear suicidal thoughts and depression, I was expecting to some, see some dude dressed in all black, you know, with like black fingernail polish and like he just came out of Hot Topic in the mall and, you know, smelling like hemp. You know, I, I don't know. That's what I was like expecting to see, you know, some gothic emo looking dude. And I turn around and I look at this kid. He looks like the football captain of the team, looks real preppy, you know, looks like he's the most popular kid in school. He's, you know, he's muscular, he's built, real clean cut. Uh, he don't look depressed. I'm thinking, Lord, he looks like anybody else in the youth camp. He don't look depressed at all. But see, I learned to not go by what it looks like on the outside. So I came down them steps, and I came up to him, and I laid hands on him. I said, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over this spirit of depression, heaviness, suicidal thoughts. I command it to come off of you in Jesus' name. And it looked like nothing was really happening. He just kind of had his hands raised to half-mast. You know, he's just, he's right here. And all of a sudden, his knees started shaking real hard, and it came up through his whole body. And it sounded like, you know, if you've ever put a kettle on the stove for tea, and it starts with that low whistle. That's what he sounded like. He's like, Ooh, just like that. And he jumped out from under my hand and started dancing across the, I say dancing, I'm using the term loosely. He was just flailing arms and legs in every direction. I mean, he was just going off. And he goes back and forth. And I'm watching this guy. He's getting free, <laughs> dancing like a maniac across the front. I turned to the associate at the meeting. I said, you know how I know that's the Holy Ghost and not his flesh? He said, how can you tell that, Brother Ted? I said, look at there. You got three straight rows of high school senior girls, potential girlfriends. I said, ain't no high school dude in anywhere that's going to do that if it ain't the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I said, you ain't going to look that dumb <laughs> unless that's the Holy Ghost touching you. He said, man, that's good. I said, yeah, write it down. I'm giving you pearls here. And so... He came back. He said, i got to give you my testimony. I said, what happened to you, man? He said, I don't even go to any of these churches that are doing this meeting. He said, I, I, I'm only here because my buddy asked me to come. He said, I was actually at home. My parents were gone on a trip, and I was so depressed. He said, I was sitting on my parents' bed. I had found my dad's handgun and loaded it up and racked one into the chamber. He said, I had the barrel against my temple ready to pull the trigger, and my cell phone buzzed. He said, when I looked at it, he said it was my buddy inviting me to come to this youth camp. He said, so I put the gun down for a minute, and he said, you know what? I will do one more fun thing with my friends before I take my life. He said, but when I get back from this youth camp, I'm going to find this gun, and I'm going to kill myself. But what he didn't realize was that was the devil's last opportunity to take him out. Hallelujah. Why? He came and got into the presence of the Most High God. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, in his presence is fullness of what? Joy. In God's presence is fullness of joy. And I'm going to preach this tonight because I'm telling you, God put a word in my spirit yesterday for tonight. It's been bubbling up in me, and I got a word for you. But this is a message that the church, some people in the church have lost sight of the power of overwhelming joy in the Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you, now's the time to take your joy, to take your strength, hallelujah, and do what God's called you to do. Can you say a loud amen? Who'd like this copy right here? Oh, man, <laughs> I shot up. God bless you. Enjoy that. I want you to look at this tonight because I'm, you know, and I can't help myself because I am a preacher, but I want to teach you something tonight and, uh, and show you that something God revealed to me. 1 John chapter 5, and I said all that to say those are all back there, and here's what I'm going to do. If you get any of those books, I have a, a devotional on joy as well that matches that book I gave her 
You could probably see it on the screen. No, you can't, actually. But if you go to the back, you'll see it. It's white. It looks inverted on the colors, white with yellow lettering. Praise, laugh, repeat, devotional. I'm going to give you that one for free. So whatever book you buy tonight, you get that one for free. And then also, we got a new one coming out that I'm going to give you for free. It's called No More Lack, 10 Decisions That Produce Financial Abundance. 10 decisions that produce financial abundance. I'm not going to charge you a dime. I'll even ship it to your house for free. If you want it, you can scan that QR code. And if it looks like alien language to you and you're wary about an antichrist spirit on that slide, you can go to the back and they'll help you sign up for it in the back as well. This is at the printer, about to be done right now. It's going to be hot off the press and I'll sh ship it to your house to bless you. Say this with me. This year will be my best financial year. In Jesus' name. You believe God can do that for you? I know he will. I know he will. In fact, go with me real quick to uh, 1 John chapter 5. And I want to read you two verses of scripture. And this is going to touch you tonight. 1 John 5. And I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. 1 John 5 verses 4 and 5. The Bible says, for everyone who has been born of God, overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Glory to God. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So can I ask you a question? Does anybody in the house believe Jesus is the Son of God? Well, if you do, then the Bible says that you're the one who overcomes the world. You're the one who overcomes the world. Hallelujah. And the Bible says this is the victory. Even our faith. So you are called as a believer to an overcoming lifestyle. And I know there's preachers that will preach. You know, how many know sometimes we go through the valley. Hallelujah. And God's taking us through to teach us something. We love our Christian music. We love our Christian southern gospel songs. He never promised that the cross would not get heavy on it. Actually, he promised that exact thing. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It sounds awful good in a song, but the Bible says something different. Jesus said, come unto me. All of you that are weary and heavy laden. You know what that means? Loaded down. He said, come unto me. All of you that are weary and heavy laden. And what did he say? And I will give you more burdens. He said, if you think you got it rough now in the world, yoke yourself up to me. I'll show you what struggling looks like. Is that what Jesus taught? No. He said, is anybody weary? Is anybody heavy laden? Come unto me, for my yoke is easy, hallelujah, and my burden is light, glory to God. He didn't say it's a hard life to serve God. He didn't say it's rough. Did he say there will be persecutions? You better believe it. He said, yeah, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But isn't it funny, people like to quote you half verses. Well, brother, you know the Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Yeah, read the whole thing. But... The Lord delivers them out of them all. Hallelujah. Not out of half of them. Not out of a quarter of them. If you've got the shield of faith in your arsenal, how many fiery darts does it extinguish? All the fiery darts of the wicked one. Not 50% of them. Not a few will slip through and pierce you in the rib cage. No. It not only stops the darts, the Bible says it extinguishes the fire that was on the dart. The power of the shield of faith. Oh, sure, there's people that will stand against you. There are those that will push back on the body of Christ. But can I tell you something so powerful? The body of Christ, the church, cannot lose. Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Hallelujah. It's the spirit of faith. We are overcoming tonight by the faith that overcomes the world. You know, my cousin, one of my cousins, she pastors with her husband in Montreal, Quebec. And their church was just like growing and growing. 
And uh, they needed to continue to build onto the church a new sanctuary and a new space because so many people were getting saved. Well, the city council told them, you'll not be allowed to do any modifications to your building. And if you try to buy a new building in the city, we've put a moratorium on new churches in Montreal. We're not allowing it. We're not allowing the expansion of churches, and we're not even going to allow you to modify your church. One of them actually told um, my, my cousin's husband, as long as I'm on this city council, you'll never do any of that work. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> so you know what they did? They started praying and fasting 21 days. And they jumped into prayer and asked God to do a miracle, to open up a way where there was no way. On the 21st day of that fast, can I tell you what was in the newspapers? Corruption was discovered on the city council. And they moved out every city council member except for one. And he came, met with my brother, my, my, my cousin, you can do anything you want, whatever you want to do. Because on the same day, their church is an Italian church in Montreal, Quebec, in French Canada. And they came to him. Same day, there was another article that came out about the church and said, Canadian government that is discriminating against minority church in Montreal. After those two things hit on the same day, they said, you can have anything you want. You want permits to build? You want a new space? And just by fasting and prayer, through faith in God, they went from an impossible situation to a place where God said, you're an overcomer. You can have what you say. Hallelujah. And when... Let me tell you, when Jesus answers your prayers, the Bible says it brings fullness of joy. Gospel of John, chapter 16. Jesus said, until now, you've asked nothing in my name. But now ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. So prayer that is answered brings a fullness of joy. And I'm going to tell you, God doesn't want you to pray for nothing, just out of duty. He wants, to pray, wants you to pray for several reasons. The first being this. When you pray, it's proof that you believe he can do what you're asking him to do. So your prayers are an action of faith that proves to him, not only am I seeking you, Lord, I'm diligently seeking you. And you said in your word that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But as many as come to God must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently. So as we fast, as we pray, as we come to church on a Thursday night when you could be anywhere else in the world doing whatever you want, but you came into the house of God, that's a sign to your heavenly Father that you are diligently seeking him. You're not just a Sunday morning Christian. You're in church on a Thursday night when they tell us people aren't hungry for God in America. But look around this church tonight. Here's a huge group of people that are hungry for God in America that are in church on a Thursday when they could be at home eating something and watching Netflix but we're ready to see God move in Fredericksburg in Washington D.C. and America shall be saved shout aloud amen. amen and so one of the reasons that God answers your prayer is because he's happy that you have proven you have faith in his power and in his ability to perform what he said he would do. But number two, remember this, he's a loving father who loves to give good gifts to those that ask him. Jesus taught that in Matthew chapter 7. He said he's a loving heavenly father who loves to give good gifts to those that ask him. So think about it this way. How many of you, you have children? Lift your hand if you have children. Some of you might even have grandchildren. Don't, doesn't it make you happy when your kids are happy? Doesn't it make you happy when your grandkids are smiling? Oh, of course, because you love them. You want to see them happy. You know, it's an interesting thought is that uh, I touched on this the other night. People that teach, you know, they're against, I don't believe God blesses his children like that. All these preachers always preach about God blessing people and God increasing people. Yeah, what do you think? You're a better parent than God? They think they're better fathers than God is. 
Meanwhile, I, I listen to these guys that bash the message of increase and abundance and prosperity. They want to bash it. Meanwhile, their 11-year-old's sitting there with the $1,000 iPhone they got for Christmas. Well, you think you're a better father than God is? Your kid didn't need that iPhone. Your kid didn't need that iPad. Your kid didn't need that Xbox. Your kid didn't need that PS5 to get through. They need food, clothing, and shelter. That's all they really need. But they've got a PS5 and an Xbox and an iPad and an Oculus and a phone running around. And then you got people say, I don't believe God wants to bless his people. What are you, a better father than God is? I don't think so. God, the Bible says, the Lord takes pleasure in the prosperity of of his servants. God is not a God that wants to put you on heaven's welfare system. He's not going to stand you in line to give you a block of cheese that's going to constipate you for the next 30 days. That's not how God functions. God loves you so much that he'll pour out blessings that you don't have room enough to contain. Amen. He loves you. And because he loves you, he wants to see you in fullness of joy. I don't even know why, but if I see my daughter crying, I'll find out. I'm like, what's wrong? What's, hey, what's wrong? You know why I'm asking that? Because I'm going to do something to change it. Did you hurt yourself? Do you need a kiss? Do you need a kiss? Do you need a kiss? What's wrong? Hey. You know, when kids are real small, if they hurt themselves, you know, kids are real small, they'll tell you something that happened, but they're so bent out of shape about it, they can't, you can't even understand anything they're saying. Baby, I can't, I don't know what you're trying to tell them. Tell me again. <laughs> you know, if kids get hurt real bad, they bang their foot real so. You know it's bad if the first cry is a silent cry. <laughs> That's how some people come to God. Huh? But he's, he's not trying to keep you in a mess. He's not trying to keep you in hardship. He's not trying to destroy your family. That's why I can't get with this theology people are preaching, that God sends evil things and puts them on you to give you a test, to get you to rely more fully on him. you got preachers that are no more preachers than I am a NASCAR driver that will tell you, well, you know, sometimes God will put cancer on you. He'll test you with it. See if you're a strong believer. Lean more fully on him. No. The Bible says God will test or tempt no man with evil. And the reason you know sickness is evil is because the Bible says that the devil uses it to oppress the men and women of the earth. Acts 10.38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing, doing what? Good. Doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the so the devil did the oppressing and Jesus did the healing. And what he did was good and what the devil did was bad. That shows you any sickness. That's why if you read the book of James, he said, is there any sick among you? He didn't say, if there's any sick among the church, then just, you know, learn how to deal with it. You know, because you, you don't know if it came from the Lord. He may be testing you. Just pray for strength to bear it. No. He said, is there any sick among you? Let them call for the elders of the church who will anoint them with oil and lay their hands upon them. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. He didn't say learn how to go through it and just carry it on your shoulders. Casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Let me, let me say this to you. You, and I want you to repeat it with me. I'm not called to carry burdens. I'm called to carry blessings. He carries burdens. You carry blessings. Hallelujah. He carries burdens. You carry blessings. He carries burdens. You carry blessings. You were created to have goodness and mercy following you. Signs and wonders following you. When you look behind, you shouldn't see demons chasing you. You shouldn't see trouble around every corner. When I turn around, I see goodness and mercy. I see signs and wonders. When I turn around, I see the blessing of the Lord that's chasing me down. Hallelujah, because he's good. Now watch, say it with me again. I overcome the world because I'm born of God. Now see, one of the things that, and, and this is where I want to get into your spirit tonight is that God has given us elements 
to walk in that overcoming power. Romans chapter 14 and verse 17, you know what the Bible says, and you can mark it in your notes or turn there. Romans 14, 17, Paul's writing, and he says, The kingdom of God is not what you eat or drink, but it is. So it's made up of what? Three things. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So the kingdom is made up of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm going to say something to you that's interesting. All three of those things are spirits, spiritual. The Bible talks about Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, the spirit of holiness. One of God's names in the Old Covenant is Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. He's a spirit. He is our righteousness. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God made him, that's Christ, who knew no sin, to be made sin. Why? So that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. What is the righteousness that I've been made? I am in Christ. He's the spirit of righteousness. He's the spirit of holiness. That's a spirit. That's not some natural thing. Righteousness in the kingdom is a spirit who is Christ. Hallelujah. We said, but what else? Peace. Yeah, peace is a spirit. The Bible says God has not given you a spirit of fear, but what? A spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Hallelujah. He's the spirit of peace. In fact, the Bible calls the Holy Spirit the spirit of peace. And he's the spirit of peace. He's the spirit of peace. What does he give you? Peace that goes beyond natural understanding. People can't even figure out why you're so peaceful. Because anybody can have peace when everything's peaceful. But what about when there's a storm? How do you have so much peace? Look around what's going on. How are you so peaceful all the time? Because you'll not be able to understand my peace. Because it doesn't come from events that take place on the earth. It comes from my understanding of the word of God. And I'm telling you something. The spirit of faith will give you a spirit of peace. Something shook me up. Have you ever seen this before? The Bible says that the apostle Peter, he gets arrested in Acts chapter 12. The reason being, they had just executed James, and when they saw how much it pleased the Jews, they said, man, if that, made, that one made them happy, let's get a real prominent apostle, let's get Peter. And they arrested Peter, threw him in prison, and most likely to be executed the next day. Now think about this. The Bible says that he's in there in prison with guards on either side of him, and the church is praying in somebody's house, and they're praying for his deliverance. And so you come in, you think about it. If it was your last night before execution, you know what you'd be doing. You'd be up in the cell praying in speed tongues. <laughs> like Porky the pig on crack, but you'd be in there just, and notice what happened when he was in there. You come in the cell, what's Peter doing? Is he running around, calling out to God? Oh, God, open a way, there was no way. I no. You go in, he's dead asleep. Peace like you've never seen. Most people have never seen this before. Why and how did he have such peace on the night before his execution? How in the world? He wasn't connected. He was not connected to the church that was praying in the house. They were doing it without him. He's up in a prison cell with two guards on either side of him, and they're about to kill him, and he's sleeping. The moment before his assassination, he's sleeping. How did he have that kind of peace? You know why? Because, and many people have never seen this, he was standing on a word that he'd gotten from Jesus. John 21, the Bible says uh, in verse number 18, Jesus is speaking to Peter. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, this is John 21, 18, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. Verse 19, this Jesus said to show by what kind of death Peter was to glorify God. So you know what Peter thought? Because that's only just a little, little while later after the day of Pentecost. So you know what Peter thought? Here I am in this cell. I'm still a young man. 
I ain't old yet, so they can't kill me yet. I'm going to sleep. And he had a prophetic word from Jesus because Jesus said, but when you are old, they will chain you up and take you where you don't want to go. Peter said, well, if Jesus told me I wasn't going to die till I was old, then how in the world are they going to kill me tomorrow? I'm still a young man. That shows you that it only takes one word from Jesus to put a spirit of faith in your heart that when it looks like it's rough on the outside, I'm standing on a word that's got me in a spirit of peace peace that you can't take from my life peace that passes understanding oh righteousness peace and joy you know we got Christians they got the righteousness part down but what about the peace and joy what about the peace and joy see peace and joy think of this the kingdom of god is like a three-legged stool righteousness peace joy you know what happens. You kick any leg out of a three-legged stool, the whole stool's crashing down. That means every one of the three is important in your kingdom life. Not just righteousness. I got to also have peace. I got to also have joy. Can I say this to you? And I know this is hard for some people to swallow. It's okay because the devil doesn't want you to know this stuff. But a, la- a constant lack of peace is a constant lack of faith in God's word. A constant lack of peace is a constant lack of faith in God's word. You say, why is that? Because fear is just faith that the wrong thing will happen. Think of that. Fear is just faith that the wrong thing will happen. You believe that what the devil said is going to come to pass rather than what God said is going to come to pass. So when I'm in a place all the time of anxiety and fear, and I don't know how it's going to work out, and I don't know, i got to stay up on, I can't fall asleep, i got insomnia, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to make ends meet. It's just me saying I trust and believe the evil report over God's report. But when you believe that the word of God is true, then the Bible says in Psalm 127 and verse number 2, he gives his loved ones rest. There's a rest for God's people. I'm not going to stay up all night and figure out how I'm going to make it and how I'm going to make ends meet for my ministry. My ministry has tripled in the last three years. If you told me where we'd be today with the mortgages we pay today, with the staff we pay today, with the television bills we pay today, with the expenses we have today, if you told me three years ago, I would have gone into an actual shock and fallen out and needed three people to come revive me. That's why God doesn't show you everything about the future before you can handle it by faith. If you're faithful over little, he'll make you ruler over much. God doesn't show you the end from the beginning. He says, just be faithful right here and let me increase you and then stand here next year and then stand here next year. And by the time you know it, you look back 36 months and you don't even recognize yourself because promotion doesn't come from the east or the west or the south, but promotion comes from the Lord and he alone decides who will rise and who will fall. Somebody shout amen. Amen. So peace comes from knowing what God's word said and believing that. Amen. I don't care how prominent the minister is. If what he's preaching doesn't line up with this word, I discard it. Well, you know, that's not what so-and-so said. He ain't the Holy Ghost. They're not the Holy Ghost. Well, brother, you know, I know. This happens all the time. Well, brother, I know I heard you preach that real strong message the other night on healing, but I'm going to tell you, I knew Sister Sarah from our church, our other church we used to go to, and she's the godliest woman you ever knew. She never missed a service. She knows she was at every bake sale. She was helping the pastor. She was the head of the overhead projector ministry. She had prophetic praise flags leaning up next to it, and she died of cancer, brother. I never knew a godlier woman, so what do you do with that? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry to hear you lost Sister Sarah, but I didn't know she was the word of God. I know it's hard for people to hear, but my theology is not defined by tragedies. My theology is defined by the Word of God. You don't know what's happened behind closed doors. You don't know what the decisions people are making. You think you do. You think you had ministers that had everything together, and we find out later there was stuff crooked going on behind the scenes. You didn't know this. And you say, I don't know why that. To, well, you don't know. You don't know, and that's why I don't allow anybody's situation to define my theology. My theology is not defined because Sister Margaret had a corn three years ago that she was never able to get rid of, and now I can't be on the dance team anymore, Pastor, because this corn's acting up every time I come through the church. 
There's a demon in that corn. I tell you, it's a corn demon. I don't know what it is. It's not sweet corn. Or... And then you got guys that are so weak. They say, well, you know, God doesn't always do it. And sometimes he sovereignly picks and chooses who he'll touch and who he won't touch. What a lie. Grow a spinal cord, get some intestinal fortitude, and preach what the Bible says. And don't let somebody's experience back you down from what the Bible said. It came out of God's mouth. It's inspired by heaven, and it's true whether people receive it or not. Amen. So peace comes from knowing the word of God is true, and I believe it no matter what. Could have freaked out. My daughter was in the hospital with a blood disease and a heart disease. They told me she'd never run again, that she'd never exert herself again, couldn't play sports, couldn't do anything. She's two years old, Madeline. Now she's 14. And here I was, just finished a tent meeting, preached, people saved, people healed, and I'm carrying her around with her eyes rolled back in her head, no life in her body. Doctor tells me, I'm sorry, Mr. Shuttlesworth. She has a blood disease. She has a heart disease. She'll not be able to do this. That She'll be on heart medication the rest of her life. She'll have, she's telling me all these bad reports. And I'm going to tell you what. My wife and I got mad. I got mad at the devil. I said, it's not going to be her story in Jesus' name. So I left the hospital. I went back to the house, grabbed myself my own prescription, a bottle of oil. <laughs> Came back to that hospital. I don't know what they thought we were frying up up in that room, but I took that oil. I walked that oil up there. I poured some on my wife's hand. I poured some on my hand. And we anointed that girl on that hospital table. And the doctor came and said, we got to take more blood. we got to do more tests on your daughter. I said, take them. You go ahead and take them. And he went and took them. He came back. When he came back the next time, he came in the room checking the equipment. He's got three other doctors. they got, you know, a uh, little... Uh, tablets, you know, they're, they're making notes, trying to figure out what's going on. He said, uh, Mr. Shuttles, we've got we to take some more tests, so we're trying to figure out what's going on here. I knew God's on the move. Something's taking place. I said, take some more tests. They came back from the, the lab the next time. Now it's him and the other doctors with the tablets, and they got medical students in the room now. This is down in Virginia Beach at Centara Hospital on Princess Anne Road, and here we are, and here they come back trying to figure it out. Finally, he takes us outside in the in the say, I don't know what to tell you, Mr. Shuttlesworth. I can't find any trace of the blood disease or the heart disease. I, I can't, I gotta send you home. I can't even let you keep the bed. We need it for other people. And I'm gonna tell you in one moment, I had a peace. My wife had a peace that the word of God is true, that our story is not gonna be like everybody else's story, because we've got a God who's able. Somebody shout amen. And I mean, months after that, just months after that, we went down. She had just turned, what, three? We went to Alexandria, Louisiana, see Pastor Mark Hankins at the Ministers and Leaders Conference. And I'm way in the back. And we're sitting there praising. And I mean, the Holy Ghost gets moving those services. You have 100 people jump out of their seat, take off running around the church at one time. You know you're at a church that runs a lot when somebody stands up on the platform and says, now, folks, if you're going to run tonight, at this church we run left to right because we don't want any collisions. <laughs> I'm being for real. <laughs> I was in Bible school one time. <laughs> I went to Bible school at 185 pounds. I came out 225. That's what ramen noodles and tombstone pizza will do to you. <laughs> Hitting all you can eat Chinese buffets every day after school. Uh, your suits don't fit right. That you button that coat, that button becomes a weapon of mass destruction. If it let go, <laughs> somebody's losing an eye tonight. And I'm in there, and I mean, I was in one of them winter Bible seminars, and Brother Hagin was teaching. I was up in the middle, and I felt the Holy Ghost. Oh, man, I, it was just rising, rising, the anointing hitting that place, faith going up. And all of a sudden, I couldn't take it anymore, man. I, I jumped out of my seat and took off running down the center aisle, and I had totally forgotten they built that church on a decline that that I was going and all of a sudden my top half's going faster than my bottom half <laughs> I'm running with everything I got and I'm thinking to myself Lord have mercy I'm looking at here comes the here comes the altar I'm gonna have to cut this turn and take a right and I'm calculating in my mind like I'm gonna have to swing this bad boy wide because <laughs> I don't have the same dexterity I used to have <laughs> and I look, and out of the corner of my eye, I see this kid coming, this skinny little kid from Detroit, Michigan, who weighed maybe 150 pounds soaking wet. And I'm doing all these calculations in my mind like I'm Einstein. I'm like, dude, this guy's going to get a, uh, he's getting everything. He's going, I'm about to plow him over. 
and they had these big potted plants, you know, next to the stage. And I'm trying to make a tight turn, man. I couldn't do it. And I came around, and just as I thought he would, he crossed my path at the right time. I hockey checked that dude so hard. <laughs> Boom, all 225 hit him full force. He went flying into the potted plant. It smashed, and all the dirt came out. He's on the ground out cold. I just kept running. God bless you. Hallelujah. I ran around that church. Power God hit me. I couldn't help myself. I came back. I was going to class the next day. He's got like students all around him. He's giving them the account from the night before. He's like, I'm going to tell you all, I took off running in the Holy Ghost last night, and the power of God hit me at the altar. I had to stop the conversation. I said, bro, that was me. I hit you. That wasn't the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I knocked your behind out. <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> And so I'm sitting in the back of Pastor Mark Hankins me. That was a free story. It wasn't in the notes. Of course, I have no notes, so we'll just see where we end up. But <laughs> I was sitting in the back of Pastor Mark's meeting, and all these people take off running just like that. Power of God's hitting the service, and I felt the anointing, and I'm just kind of worshiping, you know. And then I feel this little hand grab me and pull me like that. And I open my eyes, and there's Maddie. She felt the Holy Ghost at three years old. And she took off running around that sanctuary. And I got happy. She didn't run it once. She ran the whole sanctuary twice. You know why it got me happy? Because the doctor said she'd never run again. She'd never exert herself again. Her heart wouldn't be able to handle it. Her blood wouldn't be able to handle it. But that was just a couple laps to rub it in the devil's face. You thought you were going to take me out, but the power of God is stronger than the attack of the devil. Somebody shout amen. amen. The blessing is greater than the curse. The blessing is greater than the curse. Can you say amen? amen. Righteousness, peace, and joy. Whew, hallelujah. I feel it in here tonight. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. The joy of the Lord is your strength. So notice this now, joy is an anointing. How you know? Hebrews chapter 1 tells us. Speaking of Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says in verse 9, Because you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your brethren. Glory to God. That means Jesus walked on the earth every day with the oil of gladness. He operated in the oil of gladness. His ministry functioned in the oil of gladness. You know one of the reasons it had to have been true? If Judas was stealing out of his treasury every single day, it would have taken the anointing of joy just for Jesus not to give him a Holy Ghost backhand. I'll tell you a way I know Jesus was operating in joy all the time. You, don't, you want to know a true way to know? The little kids were always trying to get to him. I've been in church long enough to know that the kids, kids are funny because you can't make them fake anything. You pray for a kid up close, you know, hoping for a miracle. Ah, hallelujah. How do you, you receive that? What do you think? Your breath stinks. <laughs> They'll say anything. <laughs> They'll say absolutely anything. <laughs> There was a kid, my grandfather had a church in Virginia. He pastored in Norfolk, Virginia, Calvary. And, and uh, a kid was acting up in the service, and the parent took him out over the shoulder to go, go get ready to go paddle him in the bathroom. And the kid shouts out during the service, pray, church, pray. <laughs> Kids will just say whatever. But you know what else? Kids are good at spotting. They're good at spotting who the old grumpy ones are that are always yelling, sit down, quiet down, simmer down, you know. They know who those ones are, and they know the ones that are always slipping them candy and giving them money and wrestling them up and joking with them, and they find those ones. You know, when I grew up, there's a, 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 somebody got a church in West Virginia that my grandfather pastored, then my uncle, who's still the pastor, and we had this guy at the door. He'd stand back there, big old redneck guy. His name was Joe. He'd sit back there, and I've, this, I've never seen a guy. He was so thick, but he'd run camera. I've never seen this in my whole life, Pastor. This dude would sit there and run, run the roving camera for television in the church, and he'd sit there and get himself in a position like this. He had a belly that came all the way out there. He'd rest one arm on that belly and put his elbow on that, put that camera on his shoulder, and then fall dead asleep on his feet while he was running the camera. 
I'm like, how's that dude not falling down? He was perfectly weighted. It's like my father-in-law says. He said, I'm perfectly weighted. You know it's true because my bubble's in the middle. <laughs> and he'd sit there and fall dead asleep while he was running the roving can. <laughs> he said, that's how you know I'm on the level. My bubble's in the middle. <laughs> and I'd come in, and, it, I mean, didn't matter when. He'd say the same thing to me every time I came into church. He'd go, hey, Teddy, how's Teddy? Every time. Hey, Teddy, how's Teddy? And every time. He'd have a pocket full, like he had just robbed a concession stand at a Little League game of fireball candies. You remember those fireball candies? He'd have a pocket full, like he just held up a concession stand, and he'd come in after he said that, hey, Teddy, how's Teddy? He'd go, you want fireball? He had an endless supply of fireballs in that pocket, and I never missed Joe. I, if I saw him, I'd get over, I'm going to get a fireball. I, he's, I, he's got plenty of candy. There was an older lady in our church. She's gone to heaven now. She was the sweetest lady. She was in her 90s. Her name was Sister Sylvia Nicely. She had beautiful, that blue, silvery, gray hair, and she was just a precious woman. She had that nice, you know, those ladies wear those wristwatches, real thin strap. And like my great-grandmother at Maine, she, they always keep a tissue in that, in that watch strap. Y'all remember that? They keep a tissue just in case God got to move and they pull it out and dab the eyes. Go right back in the watch strap. And she'd sit back there, and she was there with her daughter. She'd be in her 90s, and she'd see me come in the church, and she'd say, Teddy, come here. And I'd come over, and I was just a young teen, maybe 13, maybe 12. And she'd say, oh, here's my, pre here's my young preacher. She's prophesying over me before I was even a preacher. And she, she'd say, hold out your hands. And she'd open her pocketbook, and in the center, you know, the coin purse is in the center. That woman had more, it's like she ran a laundromat. I don't know what in the world. She had more, if she swung that bag at you, if you were accosting her, you were dead. I don't care. Forget David and Goliath. She had a change purse full. <laughs> Bam! She'd take you out. Multiple concussions in one hit. She'd open it up, and she'd say, hold out your hands. And she'd dig her hand in the middle of that corn point. I mean, quarter after quarter, she'd dump my hands full of change. She'd say, I'm going to be your first partner of your ministry, and she'd put it, and, and just love on me like that, and see, the children know how to find people like that, people that are always loving on them, telling them they're going to be great, telling them they got God in them, you got the power of God, you're going to do great things for God, young man, and, at the, and then they know the ones, sit down, quiet down, you kids are a bunch of trouble, oh, everybody, God, talk to you every time we come in this house, you're going to learn one day, and they know how to avoid those and find the ones that are full of joy. And the children somehow knew about Jesus. Here comes the master. And they'd run to try to get to where Jesus was. It was the disciples. Like, hey, quiet down, simmer down, sit down, don't buy. And Jesus would have to tell them, hey, let the little children come to me. For such is the kingdom of God. He said later, unless your faith is like that of a child. Hallelujah. And see, they knew. Jesus wasn't some grumpy old man. This is somebody that wasn't walking around condemning everybody. Sinners were coming to him. Will you come eat at my house? Come stump, spend time with my family. Would you come talk to my kids? Would you come minister to my wife? He wasn't sitting around. I can't believe you bunch of sinners. I can't believe the hell's not opened under your feet and sucked you down into the burning flames the way you live your life. No. They were telling, hey, would you please come? Zacchaeus getting up in a tree. I got to see this man preach. I got to see this man talk. I got to see him perform these miracles. He wasn't rejecting people. He wasn't pushing people away. He was attracting men from every different place. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Jesus was living with the oil of gladness upon his life. Hallelujah. The oil of gladness. So here's the question. Why does the devil want to steal the oil of gladness from me and you? It's because he knows it's tied to several very important things in your life. We just named one. The joy of the Lord is your You know why? The devil wants to fight against a weakened church. And if he can put a spirit of heaviness on you, if he can put a spirit of fear on you, anxiety, that spirit of depression, if he can put that suicidal thought in your mind, see what I found out. It's interesting that even people who aren't Christians are finding this out. I was reading a book by a guy who's a professor at the University of Pennsylvania 
the Wharton Business School, and he wrote a book where he had studied all these reasons people make decisions to share something with someone else. And he said, after 10 years of me and my colleagues studying this subject, he said it blew our minds to find out that every emotion someone has causes them to move forward and take action except for one emotion. He said, if you're in love, you go out and do something. He said, if you're angry, you go out and do something. He said, if you're excited and you're celebrating, you go out and do something. He went, well, every emotion. He said, but if you're depressed, you recede and close yourself in. He said, when we did the study, it's the only emotion that pe causes people to stop moving forward, to retreat, close themselves in. You've ever dealt with that before, people that are dealing with that? Hey, we're going to the mall. You want to go? No, you guys go. I don't feel like going. I'm just going to stay in. You can't get them to do anything. Can't hardly get them to communicate, get them to come out. It's an attack of the devil that we're not called to live in that spirit of heaviness, that comes upon someone's life. A depress you know how you know it's a spirit? I said it the other night. There's kids in our generation and young teens that haven't even begun to live life yet that are dealing with supernatural. I say supernatural because it is. Depression. It's not natural. And then you got doctors. Well, it's a chemical imbalance. That might be how it manifests in their brain, but the Bible tells us it's a spirit of heaviness. It's a spirit of depression that tries to come on somebody. What do you do when you have somebody that's a kid that even comes come from a, a home where there's both parents in the home and they've not had to go do anything yet. They don't pay mortgage payments. They don't pay insurance. They've never been fired or laid off from a job, never been divorced. They've not been broken up from relationship. No, but they've got a heaviness on them and they've got a depression on them and an anxiety on them. What is that? Didn't come from some event in their life. Didn't come from some bad thing. No, it's a spirit trying to attack our generation. If you think, now think about this. If you think, well, it's just always been that way, then why in the last 15 years has depression and anxiety skyrocketed in America to a place that now it is the number one prescribed medication in this nation? Did you know a quarter of people in the U.S. take an antidepressant of some sort? It's, it's now surpassed heart medication as the number one prescribed medication in the nation. Why? Why have we shot up over these last 15 years to see many, many more young people battling suicidal thoughts and depression and anxiety? I'm telling you, it's not a natural thing. I mean, think about it. We're, it's, it's not like the world is getting harder to live in. It's actually getting easier to live in. We just went and saw James Madison's house today. I'm thinking to myself, bro, these are the dudes that had to really, they're laying, they, you go out there, I'm, I'm, I'm traversing a nation that nobody's ever seen before. We're drawing maps by hand. We're trying to figure out how to live through the winter, how to grow enough food so we can eat and not die through a hard winter. It's not like, it's not like it's the 1781. You know, you didn't have to come here tonight in a covered wagon. Your back's all broken out of joint because you're com coming into church. My horse took off on me, Pastor, last three miles, and my God, we barely made it. <laughs> now, if that is how your car runs, it's time for an increase in Jesus' name. But <laughs> that's how you drove it. <laughs> I mean, it ain't like it was back then. Amen. They don't have to, like, <laughs> they, don't, they don't have to pump you full of whiskey and get you to bite down on something hard so they can pull a tooth out of your mouth. Dentist time. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Just hit him on the head real hard. Knock him out. We'll get that tooth out. No, it's gotten easier. I just read an article the other day. Um, Virginia Tech. This is the first time it's ever happened. Virginia Tech. There was a Chipotle that was nearby the campus. First time ever a student ordered a burrito that was ever delivered by drone to the student. I mean, we're living in the best days that ever existed. If I have a hunger for a steak burrito, I can type it into an app, and soon I'll hear a buzzing sound in the sky, and a drone will drop a steak burrito right into my hand while I'm studying on campus. I'm telling you, this is the stuff dreams are made of. 
It's, not, it's getting easier to function. People have more opportunities than they've ever had. It's not like the world's getting more and more hard to live in. It's getting easier to live in. But we're getting closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And the devil knows that we're getting closer to the return of Jesus. So he's fighting tooth and nail to take every person down that he can take down by stealing their peace, by stealing their joy, and trying to get them to take their own life before the world comes to a close. But I came to encourage you tonight. There's an anointing of joy that's come upon your life that will drive out heaviness. That'll drive out depression. It'll drive out anxiety. It'll destroy suicidal thoughts and give you strength to run your race. Somebody say amen. amen. Gives you strength to run your race. Bible says in Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like a medicine. But a broken spirit dries up the bones. I never understood that verse. I'd look at that and think, what does that even mean? A broken spirit dries up the bones. And the Lord said, go look in Leviticus. I studied it out. The Bible says the life is in the blood. Where does your blood get produced? The marrow of your bones. What is the devil trying to do by stealing your joy? Literally, that verse is saying, it chokes the life force right out of you. Dries up your bones. Where your blood is produced. It's a metaphor to tell you, it literally dries up the life that was in you. That's what joy, it produces a supernatural strength that you could get from nothing else. A joy that's overflowing. A joy that's overwhelming. Hallelujah. A joy that's so full. That you're laughing even when there's nothing to laugh about. You're smiling when there's nothing to smile about. You're singing when there's nothing to sing about. I had a great grandmother up in Maine, right on the border of New Brunswick, Canada. And she's up there. And when she got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, she had my grandmother. She was just a little girl. And when she got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost, her husband left her. And said, I ain't living with no Holy Ghost Pentecostal woman. And left her. And he went out. And he'd get girls, and he'd drive back into the neighborhood on Saturday night. He'd say, oh, he'd mock her from the parking lot. Oh, you're not going dancing with us tonight? You're not going to hang with us anymore? She no, I don't do those things anymore. And literally, she had to go. She worked, at a, she worked on potato farms. She put, picked potatoes, did anything the farmers needed, and raised in a young girl all by herself. And I, she lived up into her 90s. We'd go up, we called her Graham, Grammy Crawford. She was four foot eight or four foot six, little Irish woman. And I'm telling you, here's a woman, if there was anyone who could have come up hard and said, I, you know, life's hard. I never saw her depressed. I never saw her upset. In fact, I'd come into her house, even as a teenager, and she'd be in there all by herself, vacuuming her carpet with a little dance. She had a little dance she'd do. She had so much joy. Graham would come, I'd come in, and I, she wouldn't know I was in there yet, and I'd hear her singing. You know, and she'd sing songs. Some of them were hymns. Some of them were just songs from World War II that she kept with her, and she would sing some of those songs that in a dark time, people would come up with songs during the 1940s, you know, during the World War, and she'd be in there, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. It's not a hymn, but it got in my spirit anyway. You'd hear in there singing, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. She had a joy in her spirit. Nothing could stop her. I mean, literally, she's up there, not much left. And she, she every, every single birthday, I'd get a, a card from Graham. This beautiful penmanship, and she'd have a check. She wanted to bless me uh, every single year, and full of joy, full of joy. She was ready to bless you at any given moment. I'd go. I went to Bible school, like I told you. I'd get a package in the mail from Grammy Crawford, and I knew what it was. And when you live with hungry boys in an apartment at college, you better know everybody's gonna get in on your stuff. And I knew what she was sending me because she knew what I loved. 
homemade molasses cookies. She could make the best molasses cookie you ever had in your life. She'd make huge, long tins of molasses cookies, probably two, three dozen of them, stick them in like a shoebox, get it all done. I don't know how she kept from northern Maine to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I'd open those. They'd still be just as moist and chewy as the day they came out of the oven. And I'm telling you, I'd tuck that box under my arm, and like a running back in the NFL, I'd run from my room, stiff-arming anybody that tried to get in my way. I'd lock that door and break those open. She'd have a little love letter in there care packages for my great-grandmother because instead of sitting around and complaining that things hard happened to her in her life and that she went through it all, if you only knew what I had to deal with in my younger years, she didn't talk like that. She talked about the goodness of God. She talked about the power of the Holy Spirit. She had thanks for God for doing so many wonderful things through her grandsons and through her great-grandsons. And what I'm telling you is, it doesn't matter what the devil tries to launch at you. There's a joy that can come upon you you, it's an anointing. Hallelujah. It drives every wicked thing off your mind and out of your house. And that joy's coming on you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. You're leaving with an impartation. Somebody shout amen. amen. Joy that overflows. Now here's a misconception. Let me say this. I'm getting ready to pray because I feel this thing tonight. Here's a misconception many people miss. They think you got to be depressed to get the joy of the Holy Ghost. But the joy of the Holy Ghost is not just to drive out depression. It's to give you a supernatural momentum to run your race and finish your course. I'm not depressed at all tonight. I don't have an ounce of depression in me. But I'm going to tell you something. I'll take a fresh dose of the joy of the Holy Ghost. I'll take a fresh touch after fresh touch. Because understand something. You can get and walk in the power of God even though you're not under an attack. Get this, because we've been taught, we've had an understanding in the Pentecostal church. Miracles are there. You have an attack come on you, and you're trying to get out of a, a rough part, and then God will just do something supernatural. And that miracle will take you out of trouble. But you don't, you don't have to be in trouble for God to work a miracle. You could be riding high, living in cloud nine, and then all of a sudden, God performs a miracle for you. Oh, yeah, has nothing to do with the fact you're in need. It just has to do with the fact he loves you and he has provision for you for every area of your life, for your mind, for your body, for your family. <laughs> Hallelujah. God knows how. I said God knows how to work a miracle for you even when you're not in need of a miracle. I'm not barely getting by. I've got joy in my spirit. But I'll take an overflow, Lord. I'll take an overflow so that I leave here so drunk in the Holy Ghost, they better call this preacher an Uber driver because I'm telling you I'm ready for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was, I was in Bible school finishing up, and uh, it was February. This was Brother Higgins last year alive. He was 86 years old, and he came in. There's like 6,000 people in the church, winter, winter camp meeting. And I'm sitting over here somewhere, and the power of God was hitting that place. And he hadn't even opened his Bible yet. He comes to the platform and opens it up, and he's trying to tell everybody where to turn for their text. And he says, open your Bibles, gives the text, and I mean already through the auditorium. People are starting to laugh. People are shouting. People are dancing and jumping, falling out under the power. No, no one's even laid hands on anybody. Places already, like the manifestations of God's presence are already hitting. And he's looking around. Turn, turn with me. He's trying to get the service on track. And then about the third time he realizes he ain't going to get the service back. So he just came around to the side. He said, well, say it out loud. For the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And I mean that place came unglued. And he walked down off those steps at 86 years old. And he just started walking around that sanctuary. And just the blessing of God started hitting those sections. He'd come to a section, huge section. Be like two of these put together, packed. And some people with their eyes closed and their hands lifted. Others just dance and shout. And, he, and he'd say, be blessed. And I mean a whole section would go out under the power. Whole section. Some people couldn't even see. They had their eyes closed, their hands lifted, and they'd power God hit them with everybody else. They'd all go down. He'd come walk right up, 
He'd say, I want this row here. Everybody stand up, turn and face me. And all those people would stand up and turn and face his direction. He'd stand on one end of the row, and he'd lay hands on one, and they'd go out like dominoes down the row. I mean, just power God hit. He's laying hands. People are getting drunk in the Holy Ghost, laughing. Others getting free, dancing. People take off running. And I'm over here, about four rows back in this section, and I'm just praying, oh, Lord, let him come over and lay hands on me tonight. Oh, God, let him lay hands on me. I want an impartation. I mean, that service probably went on two and a half hours. He never came over my side one time. Not once. I'm over there praying, oh, God, let him come on my side. Oh, I, Lord, let me get a touch, God. Never came to my side once. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of all that manifestation going on in the church, I'm sitting over there, and something hit me. Felt like somebody unloaded a 12-gauge. Boom, I went down on the ground. Nobody lay hands on me. I went down. I rolled up under the pew. I'm speaking in tongues, and something's getting deposited on the inside of me. I mean, I felt it, and I'm just praying. And, I mean, the power of God's hit me. I'm crying and praying and laughing all at the same time. <laughs> I had three girls that were sitting close by that were from the Church of God in Christ, and they just all joined hands around me, performed a prayer barrier. Nobody's touching Brother Ted tonight. Hallelujah. And so I'm sitting under there just getting blessed, just praying, and they ended the service. It was done, and I'm still up under the pew just laughing and crying and praying in the Holy Ghost. So I get up, you know. I think, well, I better get out of here and go home. Service is over. And I'm still laughing and speaking in tongues and crying. And I get to the car. I'm like, you know what? I, I ought to tell my parents how great this service was. I mean, it was powerful. So, you know, early it was like 2000. I pulled my cell phone out. They were still like Zach Morris size back then. I had a huge whole cell phone <laughs> side of my ear. We didn't have smartphones back then. We were all dumb phones. And so I pulled my dumb phone out and called my parents. And I said, oh, and, and, and I heard my dad answer on the other line from West Virginia. Hello? And I, and I was going to tell him, Dad, this service is great. And I said, I was trying to talk in English, but I couldn't stop speaking in tongues. Power of God had hit me. It took me like an hour and something coming out of that service for me to speak in English again. Something had been imparted to my spirit. A joy that was overwhelming. A joy that was overflowing hit me that night and it's never left me since. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you something. It carried with me and things started to happen and I started to see it manifest. We went to a service early in our ministry in North Carolina. This guy had us come in to preach and he was from a family very much like mine except their whole family was Southern Baptist. Mine's all Pentecostal. His uncles are all preachers. His granddad's a preacher. He was the only one in the family that was full gospel. He'd got the Holy Ghost and so he said, I'd never met him. He'd never met me but he said, I was scrolling on Facebook and your ministry page came up and the Lord said, there's the man supposed to come hold a revival for you. I said, well, I'm coming and, and I got to his church and all his people because he had just gotten filled with the Holy Ghost, many of them were out of the Baptist church. So they're not sure about this Pentecostal stuff. And his, even his family told him, we love you, son, but we ain't coming over there while you got that Pentecostal preaching at your church. And so they stayed back. And uh, But I'm sitting there preaching, and then all of a sudden, you know, in the middle of the service, the Holy Ghost starts hitting the crowd. And, and I'm looking around, and little kids start laughing in the Holy Ghost. Well, you could just figure maybe they're acting up. And a pastor's here. He's looking around at the kids. What are they laughing about, you know? And I'm just, I'm keep on preaching. But then he couldn't deny it because some of the senior saints, you know, some of the ones that come out of the Baptist church, some that were in their 70s and 80s, they're in the back laughing under the power of the Holy Ghost. He's watching them. What is happening in my church tonight? And that same impartation that I received that night in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at that Winter Bible Seminar, that joy of the Holy Ghost, that's over overflowing. It started manifesting in that place. And then that same week of services, miracles started breaking out. A young girl came. My wife used to have this video. This was probably now, I don't even, has, was Maddie, Maddie was born. She was just a little baby. And this girl came 17 years old, blonde hair. She had no ability to hear out of one ear and a hearing aid in the other just to hear a little bit. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. She took the one out. I put my fingers in her ears. I said, open in Jesus' name. When I did, she screamed like she was in a horror movie, just like red face. Ah! Her ears both popped open. And she took off running around the church. Well, let me tell you, we'd already had people lined up to pray for him. And when she took off running, the pastor, you know, he's watching me to see how this healing thing is going to go. And when he saw that girl get her hearing back, he cut everybody else off in line and took me. He said, pray for me next, preacher. He lifted his hands like that. I said, all right. 
I said, lift your hands, Pastor, what do you need? He said, I got a tumor on my eardrum. I can't hear on this side. He said, pray for my ear. God will open it. Well, let me tell you, when he first called me to book that meeting, because I didn't know him, I thought it was a friend playing a prank on me. Because this pastor had such a severe stutter, it would take him 30 seconds to say one thing to you. And I thought, oh, this is a buddy of mine trying to prank me and book a meeting that's not even a real meeting. I'm glad I never said anything like it was a joke because it was real. And he could, when he would, think of this, when he'd stand in the pulpit to preach, it would go away. And when he would stop preaching and just go on about his day, it would come back severe on his life. So I'm telling you, he jumped in the line, lifted his hands. I put my finger in his ear. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command this tumor to dissolve and your hearing to come back open. And when I did that, he screamed and he started shouting. I saw his ear was open. The gift of faith rose up in me. I slapped my hand over his mouth. Boom. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command this stutter to leave you from this night and never come back again. I said, go. And when I took my hand off his mouth, he took off running around his own church. <laughs> I'm telling you, this was early days ministry, man. We didn't have wonderful praise and worship teams. We had one country dude standing on the platform with an iPad who had one song on the iPad, and it was like a three-minute Holy Ghost Pentecostal Southern Gospel song. He'd play it, and it would end after three minutes and 11 seconds. I'd say, sing it again, and he'd hit play again, and the intro would start. <laughs> and he'd sing it again. And then, it'd you know, I'm praying, and I'm praying for people. They're coming through. People get in touch. Pastor's going around again. He went for a second lap. Power God opened his ear, and then the second time he came. <laughs> I can still remember this like it happened last night. Second time he ran around, he ran up the steps on his platform, and he ran, went to the back and grabbed a mic off the back stand. And as I'm down here praying for people, he ran out to the edge of the platform, and he started shouting in the mic, I'm going to have a salad with Italian dressing, a salad with Italian dressing, just like that. I'm sitting there thinking, like, what in the world? I look at his wife. I said, is he hungry? We need to get him a snack or something? Or she said, no, Brother Ted, he's saying all the things he couldn't say before, the tongue twisters that he couldn't get out with the stutter. And God broke that stutter off of his mouth. And what I'm telling you is that there's a strength that comes in the Holy Ghost. There's a joy that comes in the Holy Ghost so that no matter what the enemy launches against you, it cannot overtake you in the mighty name of Jesus. That's going to be your story this year. Every heavy thing is lifting off your shoulders. Every attack is running out the back door in the name of Jesus Christ. If you believe it, jump on your feet and lift your hands and give Jesus the highest praise come on back worship team come on lift those hands and worship the name of Jesus he's worthy I said he's worthy of all the praise all the glory all the honor hallelujah and I'm telling you when I was praying and I knew this yesterday God said he's pouring out in this church a fresh joy in the Holy Ghost that's coming upon you tonight you're going to run in a new strength. You're going to run in a new joy. And there's nothing the devil will be able to do to keep you from the breakthroughs God has promised for your life. God's promise for your ministry, your family, your business. There's not one weapon formed against you that can be allowed to prosper. Because as this joy begins to manifest in your life, there's such a strength that comes with it. It allows you to run that Christian race unhindered in Jesus' name. Do you know, as you run the race you're called to run, the joy is the fuel. It's like if you had a Lamborghini sitting in your driveway. That thing's built for speed. But if there's no gas in the tank, it ain't going anywhere. I don't care how aerodynamic it is. I don't care which engine they put in it. If there's no gas in the tank, it's a big paperweight in your driveway. But let me tell you, when you gas it up, it was built for momentum. It was built for performance. Every child of God was built for performance. Every child of God was built for momentum. Every child of God was built to run like Christ run, to do what Jesus did. And I'm going to tell you, that joy is the fuel that gets poured into your tank. It's the joy of the Holy Ghost. And as you run in joy, get ready to run in strength and Here's the thing I want you to get in your spirit. What hung on you before this year is not going to hang on you anymore. 
what hung on you for so long. It's loosing its grip and letting go in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want you guys to get a praise song ready. We're not ready to worship. We're going to praise because there's a joy in this house tonight. Now, I want you to hear this. When I was young, living in West Virginia, it's a different day now with kids. We did stuff as young people that I don't even know. You can't even do that stuff now. We'd get pellet guns, go out in the wood and hunt each other. I mean, just throw some heavy clothes on. <laughs> You're out. I shot you three times at the back. <laughs> Now everybody's got to have filtered and bottled water. We'd play sports and drink out of a copper hose. <laughs> yeah, bacteria is good for your DNA, brother. Just get it in. <laughs> yeah, and we go out there. Well, I'd go out walking through the woods. Some of y'all have had this. You go out there with your jeans on, you'd be walking through the woods, and when you come out, it's like there's all those sticky things all over your clothes. They're on your jeans, on your shirt, on your shoelaces. God help you if they got on your shoelaces. You're done. Those ain't coming out. And those things, they're all getting all over you. And you sit there and look. And you're like, you know what? I never felt any of those things getting on me. But when you come out of the woods, you feel the heaviness pulling on your shirt. You feel it on your pants. But one by one, they're being added. And you didn't feel them as they were being added. That's the trickiness of the devil. He doesn't come at you with the full force tidal wave because you'd know it was an attack and stand against it in the name of Jesus. So he just adds a little something here and then a little something there and tries to get you to learn to live with all the little stuff he keeps throwing at you until you're weighted down with burdens, you're weighted down with care, and you didn't even notice they'd been added because it was small and small and small. But it adds up to now a heaviness that you're carrying around. But the Bible said, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Hallelujah. And I'm going to tell you something tonight. I felt it. I knew last night God was releasing an overflow of joy in this place tonight. Now, if you're here and the enemies tried to attack your mind with heaviness or depression or anxiety attacks, as we pray tonight, God is lifting that off of your life. The same way that young man got free when I prayed. We were in Pigeon Forge. That stuff can't hang on you anymore. It's an attack of the devil, and it has to loose its grip and let go. Can you say amen? amen. But hear me. You might be here tonight and say, you know what? I don't deal with depression. I don't deal with anxiety attacks. But we all need an impartation of the joy of the Holy Ghost. I told you, I don't battle depression. I don't battle anxiety attacks. But every chance I get, I receive a fresh impartation. Do you know there's times I'll even go to ministers that I, that I follow, that I watch. I'll just turn a YouTube video on and sit there and watch them preach and teach. And I can feel that thing hitting my spirit just listening to that message online and getting that impartation from the Word of God. That fuel that comes in, it's going to put us in position. Can I tell you what it feels like from the Old Testament? How many have read the story of Elijah after he called down fire from heaven and slaughtered the prophets of Baal? And he told King Ahab, get on your chariot and head to the city and don't let the rain stop you. But then Elijah came down to the bottom of the mountain because his servant said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand rising up out of the sea. And he said, let me tell you, that's the abundance of rain we've been believing for. When he got to the bottom of the mountain, the Bible said he did something interesting. He took his robe and he tucked it into his belt. You know why? He was getting ready to run and nothing was going to trip him up. And all of a sudden, the Bible said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And he took off running across the desert floor. 33 miles from the foot of the mountain of Carmel to the entrance of Jezreel, the city. He ran 33 miles in the presence of the Lord. But he ran so fast and hard that the king who had a head start in the best chariot with the fastest horses, he not only caught up to the horses in the chariot, but he passed them and beat the king all the way to the entrance of the city. Do you know the power of that story? Here's the power of that story prophetically. That king was not his friend. 
That was Jezebel's husband, Ahab. They hated the prophets of God. They wanted to hang the prophets of God and kill them. But that was God just letting Ahab know that my men are empowered to outrun their enemies in every situation. And I came to encourage you tonight. When you receive this impartation of joy, you're going to outrun your enemies in Jesus' name. Depression won't be able to catch you. Anxiety won't be able to catch you. Sickness won't be able to catch you. Poverty won't be able to catch you. Divorce won't be able to catch you. Your children won't be able to be turned over to the spirit of this world. But you're going to outrun your enemies in Jesus' mighty name. If you believe it, shout amen. Amen. I'm telling you, tonight's a night of freedom. Shh, lift your hands. I feel it already in this place. You're already receiving the mighty joy of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> oh, yeah. And every attack of the devil that was launched against you, it's loosening its grip, letting you go. Amen. It's loosing its grip and letting you go by the power of the Holy Ghost. This is no game. People's lives hang in the balance. And the devil's convinced some life's not worth living. But I'm encouraging you tonight. Not only is life worth living, the best life you could possibly live is life in obedience to God's call on your life. Because when you step into obedience to God's call on your life, there's no greater adventure than doing what God's called you to do. It's the most powerful thing. God will take you places you could never have gone on your own. He'll, t he'll open doors for you. You could have never opened yourself. And I'm telling you, get ready. Because this is going to be the greatest year you've ever seen in the kingdom of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I'm going to tell you, as we get ready to praise God, hear me. As many of you ready to receive this, I've been stewing all day, bubbling up in my spirit with this mighty joy of the Holy Ghost. It's coming on you tonight. Get ready to leave here with weight lifted off your shoulders. Burdens lifted out of your life. Heaviness is gone. Anxiety gone. Can I tell you a great side effect for some of you that are here? The devil's been stealing your rest. You've not even been able to sleep like you were supposed to sleep. You even find yourself waking up through the night and stuff swirling in your mind and wondering. Some of you wake up and it's the same time on the clock every night when you wake up. You're thinking, are you kidding me? Every night at 3.30, every night I'm waking up at the same time. Yeah, there's a buffeting spirit that tries to attack God's people. But I'm telling you, tonight it looses its grip and God's going to let you rest. The Bible said he gives his loved ones rest in Jesus' name. Can you say amen to that? And so here's what I want you to do. Every person you're ready to receive that impartation of joy, I want you to get to this altar and lift your hands to heaven because we're going to release it by the power of the Holy Ghost and you're leaving here on another level in Jesus' name. You're leaving here with your strength. You're leaving here with your joy, your peace, your victory in the name of Jesus. Can you say amen? Glory to God. I said glory to God. Glory to God. <laughs> Every hand lifted high. Whew, hallelujah. Oh, it's already taking place. I see people are already being touched by the power of the Holy Ghost right now. Right now. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Ooh, glory to God. If you're watching online, you want to receive this tonight, just lift your hands wherever you're watching, unless you're driving a car. Lift your hands and receive this anointing tonight because the same power that's here will touch you right where you are in the name of Jesus. There's a breakthrough anointing. Sets the captives free. Destroys heavy burdens and heavy yokes. <laughs> you're going to another level. I said you're going to another level. Amen. Now let me tell you something. This is not hard to receive. But when I lay hands on you to receive this, it's not some burden. Oh, God, give it. just begin to thank him. Just begin to lift your hands. Thank you, Lord. I got a supernatural anointing, a joy on my life. Thank you, Lord. Burdens are lifted. Thank you. Depression can't touch me. Thank you. Anxiety can't stay. Thank you. I got my peace. I got my rest. Just begin to thank him. Watch what God will do. Things are turning around. You mark it down in your spiritual journal. Tonight's the night everything changes by the power of the Holy Ghost. Tonight is the night everything changes by the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus Christ, yokes are destroyed. 
by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Now here's what we're going to do. Bow your heads right where you're standing and those in the crowd. Because the blessings of God, as I've said, are reserved for the children of God. And maybe you're here tonight, but you're not ready for heaven. Maybe there's something in your life that is not right before the Lord. And you want to be sure that before we close this service, every sin is forgiven. Every single thing that would keep you from eternity with God is removed from your life. Then tonight we're going to take care of that and all things will be made new. Those of you that have your hands lifted, you can put them down. But if you are here tonight and you say, Preacher, that's me. Before we pray this prayer for joy and peace in the Holy Ghost, I want to know that I've got the righteousness part down. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And if you need that prayer of forgiveness, if you want to know that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, then right where you're standing, lift your hand and hold it high, and we're going to pray. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who else? Tonight's your night? Yes. God bless you. Don't miss this moment. God's touching people. He's moving on people right now. We'll never be the same after this night. In Jesus' name. This is, without a doubt, the greatest miracle that ever happens is when God takes people from death unto life, brings you into the family of heaven, turns everything around. Hallelujah. Here's what I want you to do. Those of you that are here in the front, just take a couple steps back. If you lifted your hand, just come stand with me right here at this altar. We're going to pray together. Come on, if you lifted your hand, every person you lifted it, come quickly. We're going to pray this prayer. If you lifted it up, come on. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Just stand right here. That's all right. Just everybody join in right here. If you lifted your hand from over here, from on the side, come now. Don't wait for somebody else. This is such a wonderful thing. A night of freedom. Amen. You know what I like about what God did? Not only did he make it easy, but the Bible says he doesn't just come in with some supernatural duct tape, duct tape you up. No. He recreates you, makes you a new person through Christ Jesus. Amen. The old life is gone. And here's what the devil tries to do. Tell you, nothing changed when you prayed that prayer. You're still the same mess. No, that's a lie. You're not the same person after this. You're a new person. Can you say amen? So let's bow our heads. I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Say it boldly. Because tonight, all things are being made new. Pray this with me. Say, thank you, Lord, for sending your son to die for me. Tonight, I ask you, forgive me of my sin. Make me new. Give me power to live for you for the rest of my life. Until I die or until you come. I confess Jesus is Lord. I believe You raised him from the dead. So from this night forward, I am your child. I'll never go back to the old way of living. I belong to Jesus. Now lift your hands and thank the Lord that it's done. Father, we give you praise. We give you glory for it. In the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus. I pray for every one of these. Keep them. I pray you put your hedge of protection around them. Watch over them. Every attack that came against their life. It leaves tonight in Jesus' name. Every attack of the enemy has to loose its grip and let go tonight in the name of Jesus. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. My brother, take my hand. I'm going to tell you something supernaturally. By the power of the Holy Ghost, the Lord's going to use you in a mighty way. He's going to use you, and people will see what a change in your life. Even the things the enemy tried to use to keep you in bondage. Yeah, the, when they see, look how, look, he's so different. He's not like he used to be. And people will come asking. They'll come wondering, what happened to you? You're not even the same guy that we used to know. No, I'm a new guy. And you can show them how to get there. And the Lord's going to use you to reach the unreachable and touch the untouchable. And from this night, those that look like they were on, they'd never go to church. They'd never come to, no, they're coming into the kingdom. Because God's going to put a fresh power and anointing on you to reap every lost soul that you come across. Don't be intimidated. Don't be embarrassed. Speak boldly and tell them about Jesus and what he did for you and what he's going to do for them. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I tell you, every heavy thing that hung on your life before tonight, it comes to an end. Every hurt the devil tried to use to destroy you, it comes to a quick end tonight in Jesus' name. This is a night of pure freedom in the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, 
one more time with those hands lifted. Father, we thank you for every new member of the body of Christ. We thank you for new brothers and new sisters. Now, Lord, as we get ready to pray for every one of your precious people tonight, open the windows of heaven. Pour out a joy that we've never known. Pour out a peace, hallelujah, that we've never known in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that, for what you're about to do and what you're already doing among your people right now. We thank you. Restoration is taking place. Anybody that battled before tonight, depression, heaviness, anxiety attacks, panic attacks, suicidal thoughts, I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Lose your grip and let God's people go. And Lord, tonight we receive a new strength. We receive a new joy. Let us run with momentum through 2024 in the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, shout aloud, amen. amen. Come on, let's praise the Lord tonight. Lift your hands and receive it oh, by the power of God. Nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord.
She had lost about 50% over here. Yeah, I have 48% on this side with the hearing aid, and I have nine on this 
on that side. But God just opened it by the power of his spirit. Can you give Jesus praise? I said, can you give Jesus praise? He's a miracle working God. I said, he's a miracle working God. I said, he's a miracle working God. Isn't he great? Whoa, praise the Lord. People getting their touch tonight. Well, would you lift your hands all over this place? Come on, give God the glory. Father, we thank you. We praise you. You're great and greatly to be praised. There's nobody like you, not in heaven, not in earth. Lord, I thank you for restoring my sister's hearing. I thank you for every new soul. I thank you, Lord, for the joy we receive tonight, a new strength coming on your people. We're going to run in a mighty measure. There's no devil that's going to stop us. There's no enemy that can take us out. Lord, I pray tonight, everything, every substance that held people in bondage before tonight, I don't care. Now lift your hands and receive this. I just feel by the Holy Ghost to pray it. Every substance that held people in bondage before tonight, I don't care if it's alcohol, nicotine, I don't care if it's pornography, prescription medication, I don't care if it's illegal drugs, I rebuke it tonight. Loose your grip and let God's people go in the name of Jesus. If you believe that, clap your hands and give God all the praise. Come on, give him all the praise. Can we sing it one more time as you return to your seats? Can't nobody. Come on. Do me like Jesus. Do me like Jesus. I said, can't Can't nobody. Do me like the Lord. Do me like the Lord. Can't Can't nobody. Hey. Do me like Jesus. I know he is my friend. Sing it again. Can't nobody. for just one moment. Glory to God. I'm telling you, I feel the Holy Ghost in here. Somebody shout better, better, better. Shout better, better, better. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm telling you, God's moving in this place. I said God's moving in this place. I said God's moving in this place. Revival's not coming. You're in it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Listen. I don't know what God's going to do tomorrow night, but it's going to be good. It's Breakthrough Friday. We got people driving in from other places. You got to come get your seat for tomorrow night. But let me encourage you. Get somebody who needs a miracle. I mean that. Get somebody that needs a turnaround in their life. Because we serve a miracle working God. Amen. We serve a miracle working God. And I'm setting my faith with you that tomorrow night is going to be a night of breakthroughs and turnarounds in Jesus' name. And we're going to see God show up mightily, and things are changing forever for us. I had my faith already in motion that this was going to be a launching pad this week for every one of us. That after this week, everything that hung on us was loosening its grip and letting go. And that we're going to run with a new momentum. And that's what's taking place. God uses these moments to put you... to. Think of it this way, to catapult you into what he's planned for your life. That what it used to take 10 years to accomplish, 20 years to accomplish, God will do in moments in your life. Can you say amen to that? What it takes others years to do, God can do in moments. And before we sow our seed tonight, let me show you something that's going to stir your faith in 2 Kings 4. Here's a woman that was in debt that her sons were getting ready to be taken from her because she couldn't pay the debts. They were her husband's, and he died. And she had no way to pay those debts. And here comes the prophet Elisha to her house. The Bible says in verse 1, 2 Kings 4, 1, the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, your servant, my husband's dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditors come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, now listen, listen to this question. What shall I do for you? What do you have in the house? Oh, man. Say this with me. What I need need is already in my house. house. 
Say it again. What I need, it's already in my hand. God will never put you in a situation where he does not give seed to the sower. And what you need for your increase or your breakthrough is not already in your house, in your hand. The Bible says, yeah, it's his system of sowing and reaping. But then he said, I'll help you out with it. I'll not just create the system. I'll put you in the system, and then I'll give you seed to sow to kickstart the system. And as you sow it, I'll then multiply your seed and bring a harvest back to you that's more than you gave. He said, what shall I do for you? What do you have in the house? Look at her answer. She said, well, your servant has nothing in the house except, well, that means you got something. Don't say you got nothing. I got nothing except. No, you got something. So what's the thing? She said, nothing except a jar of oil. Well, that's something. That's not nothing. Notice what she's doing. She's looking at her seed with harvest eyes. You say, what does that mean? She's looking at it as though it's not enough. What he's trying to get into her is, no, this seed is more than enough to get you where you're about to go. Don't ever look at it. You know, I'm sure this is cliche of some of you have heard it before. But, you know, have you ever heard the phrase, you can count the seeds in an apple, but you can't count the apples in a seed? Think about that. You can count the seeds in an apple, but you can't count the apples in a seed. Can you imagine if you planted one seed and an apple tree grew and the harvest came, you got all those apples on the tree, but then just pick one more apple and plant all the seeds in that apple. Now you got a whole row of trees. I don't know how many apples you got produced now. Take all the seeds from them, plant more. You got a whole orchard of trees. So what the, the, the phrase is telling is there's a never ending amount of provision inside the seed. That's what he's trying to get into her spirit. No, no, don't say you've got nothing. There's a never-ending amount of provision inside your seed because your seed always produces a harvest. Can you say amen? He said, all right, then go outside and borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels, but not too few. You know why he's saying that? If you're really believing for an overflow, an excess, plan for one. If you're believing for an overflow, an excess, plan for one. What actions are you taking? You say, well, you know, brother, I'm believing people are, God's going to send people to bless me. Okay, so what avenues do you have for people to bless you? Because I'll be honest with you, I feel to bless people all the time. And I'll come up to them and I'll say, hey, man, I just feel to bless you. Uh, do you got a cash app? He's like, what's cash app? Okay, uh, I got a bunch of money sitting in the cash app. I was going to transfer you some. Do you have a Venmo account? What's Venmo? Well, you got a PayPal? No, I don't have PayPal. Okay. Do you have Zelle? No, I haven't set Zelle up. I don't know what that is. Okay, so what do you have? I'm trying to find a way to bless you. I got no way to bless you. Where's your vessels at? Thanks for all the shouts. I go to some churches. No, no, listen to this. I go to some churches. They're believing for financial breakthrough, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at it, and they've got a little box nailed to the wall in the back of the church, and they got envelopes that all you can do is stuff a check in there or stuff cash in there. They don't take debit cards. They don't take credit cards. They don't take digital payments. They don't. And so we're just believing. Buddy, the majority of people that go to church now don't carry a checkbook. I don't travel with $1,000 cash in my pocket. I go to some dangerous spots. I ain't carrying $2,000 cash in my pocket. I'm big. I can smack people down if I have to, but I don't want to. <laughs> it's like that guy wrote that song. Try Jesus. Don't try me because I throw hands. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but, but understand something. And, and there's places you go. They got no vessels. They got, I'll say, Pastor, you got a way people can give by debit or credit card? No, we don't, we don't have that set up here. Why don't you? Do you have a way people give digitally? No. Why don't you? I'll ask people. I actually had a partner meeting. We had all these people in from our ministry that are our partners. I said, you know, I was preaching on this. I said, some people don't have vessels. That people want to bless you. They can't even do it. I said, I've asked people, do you have a Venmo? And they don't even have it. And a lady jumped up in the middle. She said, I got Venmo, and my username is this. I transferred her $1,000 right on the spot just for being faithful. I said, all right, good for you. And I said, that, that's what you're looking for. People say, you know what? I'm not only believing that I got blessing coming. I got ways people can bless me. I got avenues people can bless me. You know, if, you, if you're running a business, can you imagine running a business and you have a, 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 you're, you know, a mechanic shop or you're a, a hairdresser and people are going to say, uh, how can I pay? Can I pay by credit card? I'm sorry, we don't take credit cards. 
Okay, um, well, do, do you take any kind of digital appointment? You have Apple Pay here, Samsung Pay, Google Pay? No, we don't do any of that. So how can I pay for, for I would like to you know, use your services. How can I pay? We only take checks. Well, I don't have a checkbook. Well, I'm sorry, then you can't use it. It's like, can you imagine? There's nobody in the business world that thinks like that. But here we are in the kingdom of God, and our mindsets are small. God wants to send people to bless us. Get vessels, and not a few. Make sure you have avenues. And that's what he's telling this woman. Don't just get a few. Get, expect the overflow. Expect the more than enough. That's what I'm telling you tonight. Expect the more than enough. Expect the overflow. And here she goes, all right, get out there, boys, get those vessels, and they come back. Notice what he told her. Now that you've got the vessels, he said, then go into your house and shut the door behind yourself. This is a powerful thought. You know why? Because when you're believing for breakthrough, when you're believing for miracles, the enemy knows how to send people to talk to you. Well, I know you're believing for that, but I'd hate to see you get your hopes up and then your hopes dashed. No, shut the door behind you. Don't listen to any voice that has no faith in it. Don't listen to any voice that's got no Holy Ghost in it. I'm not trying to listen to people tell me how bad the economy is and listen to people how bad well, we're going into a recession, brother. No, you're part of a different kingdom. God's getting ready to bless you in such a way that it won't even make sense. Can you say amen? And I came to encourage you tonight, break through are on the horizon for your family. Amen. Look, she said, start, he said, start pouring. And they started pouring. And the Bible says they poured and they poured and they'd fill a vessel and set it to the side. Then they'd fill another vessel and set it to the side. And fill another, watch this now, until all the vessels were what? Full. And there were no more. Now watch. When there were no more vessels, the Bible says, the oil stopped flowing. You know what I'm convinced? I'm convinced that if they'd found five more vessels, God had filled them too. If they'd have found, you know why? Because it's not that they were taking all of the oil from the jar and putting them into the vessels. She only had a small jar. It's like one preacher I heard said it this way. The reason there was such overflow was because they weren't pouring oil out of the jar. Oil was flowing through the jar because it was coming from heaven into the jar and into the vessels. It was coming from the supernatural dimension into the jar and into the vessels. That's what I'm telling you. God's not going, don't look at what's available around you. Don't look at what are the limits in Fredericksburg. What are the limits in D.C.? What are the limits in Richmond? What are the limits in Virginia? You're not part of that system. And there are no limits in the kingdom of God. And what God's going to do for you, it comes out of the supernatural realm and flows into your house. And I came to encourage you on a Thursday night, that increase from heaven is coming into your hand. Somebody shout amen to that. Now look, here's God's desire. The prophet said to her, and she told the man of God about what happened. And he said, now, go and pay all your debts. But you know, here's how you can prove God's not just into you having just enough. Because that miracle, he didn't say, just, now see, your debts are paid, you're debt free. No. He said, now go pay all your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. That means there was enough to pay her debts off and still in abundance, an overflow for her and her sons to live on. It's the same thing that happened when Jesus fed 5,000 because the Bible says when they had all eaten and were full and wanted no more, he said, all right, now, disciples, take 12 baskets and go gather up the what? The leftovers. One person, thank you. The leftovers. You know what that means? You ever think of it this way? Isn't it God that did that miracle? Isn't it God that caused that multiplication of five loaves and two fish to go and feed 5,000 men plus the women and the children? There could have been 12, 15,000 people there that day. So if it's God that did it, and he knows how hungry everybody is, and he knows what they need, how come when the last person ate their last bite, there was no more bread and fish left over, and God did the miracle? No. It's a principle that he's not just a God of enough. He's a God of more than enough. Plus, did you ever think of this? Who was the one that gave Jesus that bread and fish? It was the little boy that it was his lunch. 
I always wondered, who got the 12 baskets of bread and fish? I think it went to the little boy. Because the Bible says, whatsoever a man sows, that will he also reap. I can't imagine Jesus sent that little boy home empty-handed. But see what it only took one little boy to bring to Jesus. When the harvest hit, it took a staff of 12 full grown men to bring the harvest back to that boy's house. Why? Because whatever you sow, get ready, it's coming back multiplied and you're going to reap a harvest like you've never seen. Can you say amen? amen? And so we pray. And I'm asking you, we're getting ready to do some of the biggest things we've ever done in this ministry. I'll tell you, it's, it, as I gave you the testimony earlier, our ministry, it literally blew my mind to watch God put his hand on it. And literally went around the world. Now 180 nations on television every single week. We're, I mean, I, it's, it's amazing to watch it happen. It literally, uh, Miss Tiffany that's sitting in the back doing pictures, it, the, the TV ministry blew up to the point. It's all she's doing just to handle all the TV work that we've got to do that goes out to all the different places. We're seeing salvations in nations I've never even been to before. But God's opening the doors. And we're getting ready to step out to make the biggest impact on this nation that we've ever made. I made up my mind, as I know you have. We refuse to let this nation go to hell. We're going to see God shake America one more time. And as you sow seed, you're becoming a part of this end-time harvest of souls. You play a role in seeing people go to heaven. And I say thank you ahead of time for standing with my wife and I and this team as we're believing God for revival in America. So we always pray because the Lord will speak to us about what to give. And then just do what he tells you and watch the blessing come back. Amen. Bow your head. Father, we thank you for giving us this clear picture of what you'd have us to do. You're a God that leads and guides into all truth. And so, Lord, tonight I thank you that as we hear your voice, that we will not only obey, but we'll see such a quick return on our obedience that it would blow the minds of natural men. Lord, I pray you'd bless these people so much that people would have to assume they're doing something crooked on the side to be that blessed. That they'd think they could, they'd have to sit and wonder, how in the world are they at where they are? How do they have what they have? Fulfill that prophecy in Psalm 112, Lord, where it says that you'd bless the righteous so much that wicked people would see it and get angry and grind their teeth. I pray, Lord, this would be a year that you would make your children a spectacle on the earth. Bless us with what other people are dying to get. You said if we'd seek the kingdom first and your righteousness, that all these other things would be added unto us. So let this be the year, Lord, and we're launching out in our obedience. We thank you for what you're about to do in us. In Jesus' wonderful name, everybody say amen. 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 You'll see the instructions on the screen. You can use an envelope if you'd like, uh, but there's digital ways to give that are there on the screen. You'll see it. And I say once again, thank you for standing with us. This is going to be the greatest year this ministry has ever seen by far. And I've just watched. Do you know our accountant called us in 2020 after that year was over? Because she thought that we'd gotten the numbers wrong. Because she couldn't believe that our ministry would increase that much during COVID. She said, are you telling me these numbers are right? Oh, yeah, we triple checked them. They're right. God increased us in the middle of COVID. Hallelujah. When it looked like there was no way to move forward. Oh, we moved violently forward. And I'm telling you, the next year was better, and the next year was better, and this year is going to be better. Hallelujah. Why? Because there's an interesting scripture in the Bible, Proverbs 4.18. The path of the righteous is, the, is like a shining light that shines ever brighter until the perfect day. Your path gets brighter and brighter and brighter. You're not called to diminish. You're not called to fail. Can you say amen? You're called to increase on every side. Praise God. And so I thank you for your sowing, your obedience, your faithfulness. Thanks for standing with us. We love you very much. This church has become like family to us. I told Pastor last year, just when we came, there was like a divine connection right on our first time. This was the first church I ever preached at as a pastor. Before this, I was just an evangelist. We launched our church last year in March. And after, I think, our second Sunday, we flew straight to this church. And I'm telling you, we have, like, had a, it feels like a supernatural connection with a brother. And I love your pastors here. I love this church. You're a blessing. Can you say amen? You're a blessing. Amen. 
When you're ready to give, would you stand on your feet all over this place? Lift your offering to the Lord. Even if you're not giving, fake everybody out. Stand anyway. Wave like a piece of paper you had in your pocket like it's a check. Praise God. <laughs> Lift your hands to heaven. Thank you, Lord, for every faithful giver. Lord, tonight as we sow seed, I thank you that harvests are quickly coming back to us. Lord, we're leaving here with a new impartation of your spirit and your joy. I pray, Lord, as we come back tomorrow, let heaven open over this place. Give us breakthroughs and turnarounds. Thank you for every miracle you've done so far and every one you're about to do. We give you honor and praise in the mighty name of Jesus. And if you believe it, shout that loud. Amen. Amen. Come on and give tonight. We love you. You're dismissed. We'll see you tomorrow night. Go ahead. Let's praise him.